Welcome back, everyone. I'm here again with Preston Dennett, who is a extremely popular guest. Today, we're going to talk about a an area that this podcast hasn't really touched on before, but it's the concept of out-of-body experiences. People have reported the ability to project their mind outside of their body from near-death experiences to books like Journeys Out of the Body by Robert Monroe. And this is not something that I'm randomly bringing up. There's actually declassified military documents that you can find on the CIA's website where the U.S. government actually contracted the Monroe Institute primarily for work on remote viewing programs, which is slightly different than out-of-body experiences, but also the Monroe Institute focused very heavily and still does to to this day on out-of-body experiences. So the purpose of this interview is Preston's going to define what an OBE is, discuss how one might be inclined to do one, and describe some of his lived experience in performing OBEs during the course of his lifetime and talk about some of the what he calls the higher realms, the lower realms, and everything in between. And then there'll be some speculation on why isn't this a more common experience? And it very well might be that people just don't talk about that could be one of the reasons why you don't hear more about this and other other questions. And then we'll have a subsequent episode that's on a related topic that we'll get to later. So Preston, with that, welcome. What is an OBE? <laughs> Thanks, Sean. Um, an OBE is an out-of-body experience. We have our physical body, right? And then we have what people call the astral body, the dream body, the desire body. It's actually a little bit more complicated than that. I mean, according to Eastern traditions, and they've mapped this out, we have seven bodies, the physical, the etheric, the astral, the causal, the buddhic, and so, so forth. But just to simplify things, we as human beings have an astral counterpart, a dream body. This is basically a non-physical body. This is our soul, if you will. This is what we truly are. Is that the dream body or is this the dream body? Well, that's kind of where I was going with, with this, because in a sense, you know, astral projection, as it's often called, is a misnomer. Truly, the physical body dies, it deteriorates, it's temporary, whereas the astral body is certainly, I don't want to say eternal, but by all accounts, it is. And in effect, we are projecting down into the third dimension. So in a way, the way we look at it is reversed. And astral projection is more of a returning to our true self than leaving, if you know what I'm saying here. Astral projection is simply the experience of perceiving yourself as separate from the physical body. And you're in an astral body, which has different abilities to permeate physical matter, walk through walls and such, to fly, to stretch much greater distances. It's really the superior body. It can do, has a lot more freedom. It can basically teleport, go from one area, say on this planet to another very quickly. And that's it in a nutshell. This is a natural human ability. It's recorded in all cultures. Accounts stretch back many hundreds, if not thousands of years. Most people will experience one or more out-of-body-like experiences in their lifetime. It's something we actually do every night, according to the experts, and I absolutely agree with this. So it's really all about remembering what goes on at night. Like flying dreams are often half-remembered OBEs. This is an absolutely natural experience that we all have the ability to do. Now, if one were inclined, how would one activate an OBE? There are various methods. I would start by saying that There are some obstacles, and one is fear. People have a lot of fear surrounding this. Uh, They think it's like scary, and yeah, it can be, but it is safe. It's as safe as sleeping. Another major obstacle would be just laziness. People don't take the effort to do it. So I think those are the two main obstacles, and it is actually not hard to do. I did not believe really in out of body experiences until I picked up Robert Monroe's book which you mentioned, and he tells his story, which is really quite compelling. I will say it's been proven in a laboratory setting. The whole out-of-body experience is not pure speculation. 
And how was it proven? Again, if I were to do an experiment, right, I would have somebody in a room that would do the out-of-body experience. And then I would have somebody outside the room in another location doing a specific activity, wearing specific clothing. And then when the person returned from the OBE, I would interrogate them in terms of what did you see? What was the person doing? And if they could accurately account or describe that activity, then, and you, you know, you account for, at least you siphon that person off from any external electronic equipment, things like that. You can independently verify that it works. Is that, are those are the sorts of experiments that people have done? Yeah. Along different lines as well, too. I mean, Robert Monroe has done this. There are many experiencers or OBEers who have been able to go visit distant locations and describe them accurately. Uh, but some have also appeared as full-on apparitions. Robert Monroe was able to do that. Uh, he's also able to affect the environment. There's you know, a series of experiments in Europe where a gentleman was able to verify people were going out of body. Sylvan Muldoon, a very early obe was able to appear as apparitions to several people. I was able to do that a couple of times myself after many, many attempts. I mean, I approved, proved it to myself, which is much easier to do. Approving it to someone else is not so easy. Right. But, but yeah, I mean, there are some good scientific experiments on this. Robert Monroe does talk about this in his books. So if there have been scientific experiments, and, and I have a theory behind this, but I'm curious what your theory is. Why isn't this more widespread and accepted by the scientific community? Yeah, that puzzles me, actually. It is of great interest. I think it's hard to believe. I don't know why it isn't more popular. I feel like at some point it will be, because really all it takes is to have one really good experience and you're, you're in. I mean, you're sold. It is absolutely the most transformative experience I've ever had, and I can't talk enough about it. But I think, yeah, there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of skepticism. That's another big obstacle. People don't think they can do it. I think, you know, this is the realm of yogis and saints, and no, it's not. Anybody can do this. I am not sure why it's not more popular. It absolutely puzzles me because it is such an amazing experience when it happens. I think it's three reasons. Number one, fear, as you said, is is a big one because people have superstitions about it, right? So it was popularized, I think, in a recent movie. I can't recall the name of the movie, but there's a movie where folks do out-of-body experiences and then their their bodies are hijacked by demonic entities and things like that. And we'll return to that because I want to I want to ask you a question on that. But that's number one is just fear. Number two, I think there are religious barriers to it, particularly in Christianity, people would associate it with the work of the devil and things like that. They Which is ridiculous, fake. by the way, because there are numerous accounts of hundreds of saints who did who did this. This was a regular part of prayer and meditation. And right, yeah. So yeah, yeah, if you if you fast and go to the desert and meditate, oh, you even have uh, cloisters where you have monks that don't talk to each other. And I don't know if they've had you know, out of body experiences or not, but it would breed an environment where something like that would be more likely. If you know, it's, it's a natural human tendency to want to communicate, and I figure people would be more likely to engage in things that might be perceived as fringe activities in order to satisfy that natural emotion. And again, I'm not saying I, I ascribe to any of these theories. I'm just shoot, throwing them out there. But you have fear and then you have faith-based fear. And then the third part, which could be the biggest driver is if you are a government and you have secrets that you need to keep, OBEs and then its cousin, remote viewing, is an absolute threat to that. So if you were to encourage people to develop this activity, you wouldn't be able to hide your secrets. You wouldn't be able to prevent the Russians or the Chinese from doing the same thing and looking into the technologies that you're working on in order to preserve your, your country's national defense. So it would be in a government's incentive to suppress, deride, obfuscate, harm the reputations of individuals who are proponents of this particular, uh, these particular techniques. And I think that that could be a, a big driver. And in the intermediate term, 
uh, you know, I can I can understand why they would do that, right? To protect the country and to pre- prevent wars from happening and things like that. In the long run, though, you know, if 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 this is true, right? Personally, I've never had an OBE that I can recall. That doesn't mean I've never had an OBE. But in the long run, if this ability is real, which based on individuals' accounts, near-death experiences, stuff like that, I believe that these people had these experiences. I just don't, I don't know because I can't recall any of my own. And you know, the difference between believing and knowing. But you know, if the long run, if 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 they're real, this could be a net positive for humanity because no secrets are hidden anymore. Um, exactly. People yeah. can communicate um, more directly, and there's less reason to fear because your imagination is not projecting malicious intent on other people. And fr- frankly, it's also a corrective on people's behavior. Even with social media, all the negatives that y- you see from social media spreading misinformation, things like that, there's also been a positive effect of the internet is that governments increasingly can't control media organizations and things like that. I mean, they still they still do in many extent to many extents, but there's there are counter narratives out there that when you try to pull the wool over people's eyes, the truth eventually comes out. This sort of ability would make the truth ubiquitous and impossible to hide information. So again, in the short term and intermediate term, it could be enormously disruptive to society and civilization. But in the long run, I think it's you know, it would be highly beneficial to the human species. Yeah. So well, anyway, we, we know governments do take it very seriously. As you mentioned, I mean, there's documentation on this. They yeah. are very, very interested in it. Yeah, that that's real. why we're talking about it. That's why I'm putting my rep, like my, you know, reputation, you know, up up to because I, I, I want people to know that like this, I'm not like just coming at this like, oh, this this is, you know, I have a personal interest in this, which I do. Um, and and I do want to believe. And but that said, me recording this video is like I've seen documentation, uh, and I could tell you I could tell you what unit worked on it the 902nd Military Intelligence Battalion, right? At least in some of the documentation that I've seen that that talked about contracting with the Monroe Institute. I don't know if that specific unit did, but you know, and there are names, right? There are names that associate. I can't I don't have them off the top of my head, but there's like you know a lieutenant that wrote a lot of these memos. Um, and there's a you know an actual unit that existed back in the 1980s and 1990s. So, so so with that, uh, you know, I think I've answered my own question, but I was just curious where where you stood on it. Now, in terms of how to do this, if if someone were to at least want to attempt it, where like what, what should they do to start? Right. Well, I mean, it's surprisingly simple. Um, as I mentioned, this is something we do every night. So the real trick is remembering. And that would be the first step is keeping a dream journal and doing your best to remember what is going on at night because you are already doing this. That would be the first step is really trying to work on remembering what happens at night because uh, we are fully conscious uh, w- when we go to sleep. I mean, we know this from brain studies. Uh, we don't fall unconscious in the way that people think we are. And and I've proven this to myself. Uh, We are all conscious on the other side. So how to do it is basically a three-step process. And the first step is to physically relax. And this is a very difficult step for people. We do have a lot of tension and stress in our lives. And what you wanna do is find a nice quiet place. For me, it works best late at night or early morning, but you can do this at any time in an easy chair or in your bed, uh, anywhere. And you wanna physically relax to the point where you start to feel hmm, one of several sensations, heaviness, lightness, numbness, tingling. Uh, You wanna get to the point where you don't even know what position your body is in, Um, Just so deeply, deeply relaxed that you ultimately want to reach what's called the vibrational state. And that's Robert Monroe talked about this. You'll feel, he described it as feeling a mild electric shock. Uh, 
which I felt, and sometimes it's not just mild. I mean, this can be a tremendous electrical buzzing throughout your whole body. So basically you just wanna reach a point where you're profoundly physically relaxed. And this can take 20 minutes, half an hour, an hour, uh, depending. And you just go through all your muscle groups and letting go. It's a process of just full on physically relaxing. Are there any breathing exercises or anything like that to slow your heart rate that you recommend? That deep breathing works. Um, just uh, really, it's just a process of letting go um, and really concentrating on your muscle groups, starting with your feet, your hands, moving up your legs and so forth, and doing that several times. And just, you can almost always physically relax progressively more. So this may take several go arounds to do this. Um, I've, got, I've reached a point where, you know, I can just plop in bed sometimes and whoosh, I'm off. But often, no, uh, it takes time to physically relax. So that would be the first step. And the second step would be to mentally relax. Uh, because we do have a stream of consciousness that's constantly flowing through our mind, mm -hmm. uh, even when we're awake and when we're asleep. And as we go to sleep, the stream of consciousness starts to really manifest as images and dreams, and we kind of fall into it and become entranced into a dream. All the images, everything that's running through our mind is, we, is becomes the dream, and we're projecting our own mental images around us. And uh, that's how people fall into sort of this dream state and are not fully aware so really the, tr the, the trick is- I, I, fre I, I frequently, look, I've tried this myself and I've never been successful, at least not consciously. But I always, in attempting it, there are many times where I find myself being distracted by a dream and then I'll, uh, and I'll kind of realize, you know, in the very beginning, wait, why, why am I- <laughs> Why, why am I why am I seeing this? And then I'll snap myself back into that state. So it's almost like I'm trying to um, you know, keep myself on task. So uh, yeah, sorry, continue. I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's very difficult. I know it's actually amazing when you start doing this because you will see full on colors and images. You'll hear sounds, voices, uh, lights. Uh, it's very easy to just fall asleep and go right into it and not even realize it. So a trick is to perhaps lay on your back unless you, or your side, depending on, I mean, if you sleep on your side, lay on your back. If you sleep on, you know, laying on your back, turn on to your stomach, turn into a position where you want to immediately fall asleep, perhaps prop yourself up a little bit. Uh, so you don't just fall into the dream, which is so, so easy to do. You want to get to that hypnogogic, hypnopompic state where you're right on the edge of falling asleep, but you still maintain your awareness and you kind of separate yourself from that stream of consciousness, which is multi-layered, as you'll find out. You're thinking of your surface thoughts about you know, all the things you've procrastinated, the movie you just watched, the songs you heard, uh, people you've talked to. All of this chatter is going on on multiple levels. And it's really interesting when you start to become aware of this, is how just crowded your mind is with your own thoughts. So those thoughts, so, are they coming from within your mind or are they coming from the outside in? Like from uh, well, consciousness outside? Sorry, I'm asking really crazy questions. No, but. no. I mean, it's a good question because you'll find out that, yeah, these are not always completely your own thoughts. Uh, you do pick up on the things around you. But to a large extent, I think depending on the person, uh, it's mostly you. Uh, and it's a really good exercise. I mean, there are things you can do. You do want to overcome your mental and psychological issues. If you have a tendency to procrastination, that's going to steal a lot of your consciousness away from you because you've got this whole list of things you're thinking about. If you have troubles with anger or greed or gluttony or lust or all of these things, 
that steals your consciousness, your awareness. And these are issues you have to deal with. You have to face your fears, realize your desires. Uh, and you can see this in the dream state, because this is what dreams mostly are, people you know, exploring these psychological issues, fears and desires is what most dreams are. I wrote down every dream I ever had. I interviewed everyone in my family. I've really dug into this. I mean, I've got all the books I can find on this. I am not just speculating here. Uh, I have really dug deep into the out-of-body experience and done it myself. Uh, so, so this is... So, so with that, I mean, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll get back to, you know, how to, how to do this. We're in the second stage. I just want to keep us on track. But you mentioned books. Um, there's there's Robert Monroe's three books, uh, Journey Out of the Body, um, Ultimate Journey, and then there's another uh, uh, something. It's like the Far Far Journeys or some, something like that. Um, yeah. I'll I'll put them down in the in the links below. But what other books would you recommend? Oh, there's a lot of them. Um, I would recommend Sylvan Muldoon's books. They're very early books. Uh, Robert Peter Peterson. Uh, Robert Bruce, uh, Rosalind McKnight, Marilyn Hughes, uh, Leland Hansen, I think is his name, or Kurt, no, Kurt Leland, sorry. Uh, gosh, there's another guy. He's one of my favorites. His name is escaping me, but it'll come to me. Uh, there is an enormous amount of literature on this subject. I wrote my own book on it, which I think is... Um, really good for beginners because a lot of the writers what's, it, have what, what, what's the title a journey let me see out of body exploring a beginner's approach because a lot of the authors on the subject just dive right into the deep end mm -hmm. and, and i think it leaves a lot of the beginners a little frustrated because uh it's hard to for some people there's a little bit of a steep learning curve uh and I and mean, some people can do it on their first try i've given you know presentations and lectures on this talk workshops and it's yeah it's not hard to do this is a natural human talent i i learned it from robert monroe's books started doing the exercises he recommended which i've kind of redesigned for myself right. but it took me about a month and a half and really the first week my dream recall doubled I started having pre-lucid dreams Lucid dreaming is a big part of this. And lucid dreaming is becoming conscious in the dream state. And it's essentially an out-of-body experience with the only difference being you're projecting a dream around you instead mm -hmm. of perceiving reality objectively. Uh, but yeah, this is not hard to do. Again, it's a matter of physically relaxing and then mentally relaxing. And then there's the third step. Once you're physically relaxed to the point where you're you know, you can't so, so feel your body. So the second step to reiterate is just avoiding being pulled into the dream state. Yeah, you're not, probably not going to be able to stop this just parade of thoughts. And it's really funny because I've tried. and I mean, a big brass band will start playing and you will just, I mean, it is intensely loud, our thoughts. Uh, so you just kind of want to separate, step back don't we have a tendency to cling and attach to everything so just step back and watch it watch it go by it's a river that's flowing by you and you can step back and it you could probably slow it down and if you're you know spiritually advanced you can get to the point where your mind is much quieter and this is when you overcome a lot of your issues with you know greed or anger or lust or gluttony or you know, the seven deadly sins, there's something to that. And this is why I think a lot of the Catholic and Christian saints were so successful at it, because they were very moral people who overcame a lot of these hindrances to expanding our consciousness. So yeah, face your fears, realize your desires, work on yourself morally, and it will make it a lot easier for you. But it's not a requirement. Anyone can do this. It's a great you know, going out of body, you will work out your issues, um, which I found out popping out of body, I would be overcome with anger, overcome with lust, overcome with gluttony. 
It was crazy <laughs> the things you go through because it all comes at you at full force. Uh, but getting back to you know the steps on how to do it, uh, it's very simple. You physically relax, you mentally relax. And so at some point, once you're physically relaxed, you turn your attention 180 degrees inward. Stop paying attention to your body. Don't worry about it anymore. Don't think about the room around you. So you have to completely go inward and ignore the body. Because if you think about the body, that will pull you right into it. So you just want to relax, 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 and then leave that behind and work on mentally relaxing. And once you've done that for you know 20 minutes or so, and you'll know you're ready when you start seeing images or feeling movement or seeing colors, because uh, your thoughts will start to become imagery. And uh, you'll hear voices, uh, this sort of thing. And it's perfectly natural, no, no reason to be alarmed. Uh, and once you feel like you're mentally relaxed and uh, don't dwell on it too long because you really want to get to the third step, which is focusing and visualizing. So you focus your attention on sort of combine your intention, your willpower, your imagination, your desire, you put this all forth and say, I want to go out of body. I am out of body. I will go out of body. I will remember everything that's going to happen to me tonight. These are affirmations. It's a way of focusing your intent. And so that's really the trick to this. And a, a, how I would do it is really obsess myself with this subject. I would read about out of body experiences before going to bed and, and really try to focus on it because your mind is very, very just easily distracted. It wanders all over the place. You've got a million different directions you're going in. So it's all about focus, 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 focus. And then once you do that, you do visualizations. And this is the real trick. Um, there are some very effective visualizations that work like a charm. And one, my favorite really is just visualizing, imagining yourself running, running down a pathway through the woods or along the beach, doesn't really matter, through a field, a corridor, just as long as it involves movement. Because what will happen is that will pull you right out of your body. Anything involving movement works like a charm. Imagine yourself on a swing, swinging back and forth on the bow of a boat, going up and down in the waves, standing at the base of an escalator and going up, holding onto helium balloons and rising, an elevator, anything involving movement, rolling out of bed. That's, uh, you can visualize a rope or a pole hanging above your bed and actually pull yourself out. I've done all these methods and some work better than others. I think it depends on the individual, but really anything involving movement. That's, and there's variations of this. Another variation would be to imagine yourself in a place you know well, uh, which probably shouldn't be the place you're at, your bedroom, but say your backyard or your childhood home, or really any place. And it's amazing because what will happen is it will coalesce around you and you'll, you're suddenly like pulled into it. And you'll, you'll think it's a dream at first until you, you're, I mean, until you're there and suddenly you realize, oh my gosh, I'm actually here. Uh, it's a way to draw yourself out of body to another location by visualizing a location. And a third method that's very similar is what I would call the love bridge. And this is appealing to a deceased loved one. Uh, a lot of people have dreams about uh, if you've lost someone, you'll dream about them, they'll come to you in your, your dreams, you'll visit with them, and it feels very real because it is. Uh, again, this is... <laughs> We all have an astral body. We're all going to be leaving this physical body at some point. 
Uh, and if you look at the literature on near-death experiences and out-of-body experiences, this has been proven. Uh, this is very real and appealing to a deceased loved one or spirit guide, because we all have them, is a very simple and effective method, especially for beginners, because they will come to you. This worked for me because I, how I got into it was I lost my mom. And uh, that was really my motivation. I wanted to know if there was life after death. And many of my early experiences involved her. So you basically just visualize a deceased loved one, what they sound like, what they look like, what it's like to be with them, call out to them mentally, because they are watching over us. We all have many people on the other side who are our friends, our relatives, people we've shared lifetimes with. And this, those are the methods to really go out of body. And I would just give one more. And this is a really effective method that you can do during the day. And it probably works better than anything. Um, so here's the theory behind it. We spend about two thirds of our life awake on the physical plane and one third on the astral planes when we're asleep. And what you do during the day while you're awake is ask yourself very seriously, am I out of body right now? Am I dreaming? Could this possibly be a dream? Could I be out of body right now? And this sounds ridiculous because you know you're not. Uh, you're, you know you're awake, you're at work. I mean, you know it. But if you ask yourself this, continually, like every hour, or every time you go to the bathroom, or every time you walk through a doorway, if you can discipline yourself to do it regularly, you will do this at night when you're asleep. And boy, you will get a shock. You will be at work. And you're like, all right, I'm going to ask myself, you know, am I dreaming? <laughs> you know, could I possibly out of body? And you do what's called reality testing. And there's a few methods to do this. One is to just look around you and see if there's any bizarre inconsistencies. Like perhaps your driveway is facing the wrong way or you're looking at your home and the, it's an old couch that you don't have anymore or just some, something different to how it normally is. Pretty much every dream, if you record your dreams, you'll see it. Pretty much all dreams have at least one bizarre inconsistency where it does not match physical reality. These are called cues. And it is, I think, there purposefully to wake people up. So you have to really, really be critically aware of your environment at all times. Really examine it and look around to make sure everything is copacetic and normal. Because you will be at work and realize like the desk looked different or something, and then boom, but you'll ask yourself this question and you'll sudden the environment will just dissolve and you'll see you're floating above your bed or you're wandering around somewhere or you're on the other side. It's a shock when this happens. Another really good reality check, and this is so simple, is to just try to push your finger through your desk, just boom through the wall behind you, just press it. And, and because your astral body has the ability to permeate matter, um, it will go right through. And again, you'll be <laughs> at home eating dinner or something, watching TV or at work. And you're like, all right, I'm going to do this stupid exercise. I know I'm awake. I already know I'm physical. And it, you'll push your finger through your desk and it'll slip right in. And you're going to get a huge shock when you, this happens because you think you're awake. This is the problem. People are dreaming and they think they are awake and they are not. The dream environment is 100% real. It is actually more real than the physical environment. And you'll learn this when you go out of body. It's hyper real. It's more real than it is here. So you want to test your environment. You could like pull on your finger and it will stretch. Uh, another good method is to try and levitate, jump up, just stand up and jump. And, and what happens 
is you'll probably you know fall back to the ground because you're physical uh, doing it throughout the day. But at some point, again, you'll just try it. All right, I'm gonna do this stupid exercise because I know I'm awake. And you'll hop up and you will soar up into the sky. It is so awesome when this happens <laughs> because it's just the biggest shock in the world to find out that you are already out of body and you did not even consider it. When you say it's more real or it's hyper real, what, is that, what does that mean? It's very hard to describe. Uh, you know, and you, you'll all see it when, once you do it. But uh, the colors are extremely vibrant. Um, the way I would describe it is like the difference between uh, normal black and white TV to high definition. The detail is much more, it's much more detailed. Uh, the, the ground, the, wa the walls, the, the plants, everything. It is more vibrant, it's more alive. Uh, Everything glows with an inner light, an inner life. Uh, it's just almost impossible to describe until you actually experience it yourself. But it is, I mean, you will know <laughs> because, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't really even have the words for it. The air itself sparkles. It's just so much more vibrant and alive and real. There's a supernatural reality to it that makes Earth look like a washed out watercolor painting. I mean, it is absolutely the difference between night and day. It's like going over the rainbow in the Wizard of Oz um, and seeing color for the first time. It's that dramatic. Why do we forget? Uh, I have looked into this, uh, there's a tendency, we, we've compartmentalized our mind. And uh, we, it's sort of like switching channels. And I don't know precisely why, but it's the same phenomena where it's very hard to remember dreams. Or you can be laying in bed and you're very vividly dreaming and you wake up and you get out of bed and whoosh, it's gone. It's a different vibration. It's a different channel uh it's yeah really all about memory and try so this is why it's very important to try to remember everything that goes on at night and that's what you should do when you go to bed is tell yourself i'm going to remember everything and uh it really is all about memory i'm not sure why it's so difficult to remember dreams and the out-of-body experiences other than it's on a it's a different dimension it's a higher vibration it's an octave upwards and uh, we are, I, don't, I, I really don't have a good answer for it uh, but yeah I, I agree with you it's very difficult to remember and a real trick is when you wake up in the morning don't move don't move or not even turning you know rolling over stay exactly where you are and think back and ask yourself three things. Where was I? Who was I with? And what was I doing? And that will bring you back. And this is something you wanna carry out throughout the day. Like always ask yourself, where am I? Where am I right now? Who am I with and what am I doing? Do memory exercises. Think back to yesterday. What did you have for breakfast? What did you have for lunch? What did you watch on TV? It's, you really want to improve your memory as much as you can. And uh, this will facilitate going out of body. But yeah, the real trick is that exercise. Reality testing throughout the day. That works so well. If you can do that three, five, ten times a day, I guarantee you, you will do that at night and you will find yourself already out of body. How long does it take to... You know, from I know you said some people can do it right away, but people who are struggling with it, how long, like, how long do they need to keep at it at the extreme side in order for it to, to work? Very much like learning a, a musical instrument, a computer program, how to 
you know, do a, a extreme sport, you know, skiing, you're, you're probably not going to be able to ski the first time you do it. Uh, it's going to take a few attempts. Uh, for me, it took about a month and a half to two months before I had my first actual OBE. Uh, some people are just naturally good at it. Uh, I've talked to people who took, a, took them a year or two. I think it's different for everybody, and it really depends on your level of focus, your dedication to the subject. I mean, you, people don't become a doctor overnight. Uh, but if you really, really want to learn something and you devote all your attention to it, it shouldn't take long at all. You can do this very quickly. But, you know, it takes, you know, three, four hours of meditation a day if you really want to do it right away. Uh, but for me, I would just meditate about an hour each night in the beginning. That's all it took. And uh, immediately I started, I mean, you will immediately see a result in your dream life if you do it, and meditation, these exercises an hour before bed or in the morning. But five minutes is even effective. The more you put into it, the better your results will be. And I can tell you, I've taught workshops on this. I've taught people how to do it, taught several family members. Uh, it's absolutely doable. And um, I think it's important that to let people know it's not dangerous. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I was, that, was, that was my next question, actually. Like, what are the, are there any risks? Um, and if they're not, what, what sorts of things can scare people initially? Like, do they see, um, uh, like other apparitions? Do they, do they see things that could terrify them that they need to push through? So that's kind of two or three questions, but if you could address those. Yeah, yeah. We are a somewhat fear-based society. And people do allow fear to motivate a lot of their actions. Fear is a guiding force in people's lives. It really is. Which is, once you have your first OBE, it absolutely <laughs> makes a lot of your fears evaporate. Fear of death is a, one of the most profound fears that really guides us. <laughs> and that first OBE will release that to a large extent. So uh, fear is a huge problem with this but no it's not dangerous it's as safe as sleeping you are already doing this and uh, i think that people have fear of perhaps being possessed by a negative entity while no. you're gone effectively right because right? Right. you're not really fully vacating your body you're just going your astral body is connected to your physical body by a, what they call the silver cord uh, which you might see, you might not initially. I never saw mine until you know I started to wonder about it, and I searched it out, and I was able to see it several times. Some people never see it, uh, but some people see it all the time. It's different with each person, but you do have this silver energetic cord which pulls you back into your body the instant you feel any danger or any strong emotion. Uh, you don't have to worry about being possessed. Uh, we all have spirit guides, and they are very aware of what you're doing, particularly in this regard, and will watch over you and guide you and be with you when you're doing it. So there's no dangers of getting lost, going too far out, being possessed, or anything like this. And believe me, I searched the literature on this because some of these early books talked like, oh, you know, this is dangerous but had no examples. It was pure speculation. And the more I looked into it, I couldn't find really a single case of any real danger to this. Other than, it, yeah, sometimes it can be scary because you'll pop out of your... My third out-of-body experience was terrifying. I wasn't fully aware and I thought I had died. I thought I was dead. And the cold dread that swept over me was chilling. And I dived right back into my body you know, in absolute utter terror until I, you know, woke back up in my body and realized, oh, I did it. You know, that was an out-of-body experience. Uh, fear can be very profound. There's a very strong fear barrier. 
So what happens you'll, is when people pop out of body, they become super excited. That was my problem. Uh, or super scared. But I scoured the literature on this. There, it, it's not dangerous. And in fact, it's the opposite. The benefits of this are unestimable. I mean, it's unlimited. You increase your lifespan basically by one third because you have all these other experiences that you're missing out on consciously at least. Uh, healing, physical healing. I found 20, 30 cases of people who've been physically healed of colds, of chronic disease, sarcoidosis. Bruce Moen, that's another guy who's really good at this, had sarcoidosis, a very serious liver disease, and cured himself. Another guy, uh, Albert Taylor, I'd recommend his book, had, I think it was m multiple sclerosis and was able to improve his condition profoundly. Uh, many cases of people who've been physically healed happened to Robert Monroe. Uh, people have healed themselves of cuts and bruises and colds and flus and all kinds of stuff. It's amazing. People, it's a really good vehicle to physically heal yourself and uh, remove the fear of death. And all the experiences you can have are outrageous. I mean, you can... <laughs> Um, do just, I mean, it's unlimited. You can live out any fantasy you want in a sort of a lucid dream state. This is what often happens. This is why it's called the desire body. Because when you pop out, all your suppressed emotions are going to come roaring back at you in, at full force. Thought, consciousness rules the astral plane. So if you think it, it will manifest. And if you have, you know, lots of focus on lust, well, get ready because you're going to have <laughs> all kinds of amazing, fun experiences. I mean, I had a really good time with that. <laughs> I don't want to get too personal, but boy, the things you can do are outrageous. And food, you know, I don't have an eating disorder by any means, but apparently I had some issues with it because I would manifest feasts of food and just gorge on brownies and chicken nuggets and Neapolitan ice cream and sour cream and onion potato chips and orange juice and i mean it's and if it's real i mean you taste this and feel it and it's amazing and anger yeah i had a, some, apparently some anger issues thought it was pretty level-headed but <laughs> popping out of body i would become overcome with anger at, at rage and i had to deal with that so it's a great place really to work out your issues and uh, it's just something to be aware of that when you pop out of body, uh, for me, my real issue was excitement. I, my very first experience, I popped out of body and I had laid down during the day. I was a little depressed. This was not long after my mom had died. And uh, I was really trying to deal with it and uh, just laid down on my stomach and felt the vibrations. I'd reached the vibratory state very quickly. And which Robert Monroe talks about. He says, it's a mild electric shock. Uh, for me, it was not mild. It was severe. And I honestly thought I had stuck my finger in the light socket next to my bed and was being electrocuted to death. This was what I was thinking in my mind. I'm like, what is going on? What is, oh my God, I'm being electrocuted. When I whoosh, popped out of my body, um, I could feel it, like an audible sound too, pop. And I'm floating through my room. I went right across the hallway into the bathroom and stood up and grabbed the counter and looked in the mirror. And I didn't see anything, uh, which was a very bizarre experience. And that's when I realized I am out of body. I actually did it. This is real. Oh my God, this is amazing. And I got so excited. I got instantly pulled back into my room. I saw somebody standing next to my bed, which really shocked me. And I couldn't make out who it was. My vision was kind of blurry. And I went horizontal and I sank back into my body and woke up. I'm like, this is real. I did it. I'm doubling down. I've got to do this again. And, you know, I'm working full time. This time so I'm very busy in my life. So really, I did it mostly on weekends when I could sleep late. And so it would be early morning and this would happen. And I did it again a week later. Same thing. Same exact experience. 
into the bathroom and back again. Third experience I already described, I well, actually just woke up out of body, standing next to my bed in the middle of the night, finally came to awareness and thought I had died. I could see myself lying in bed. I was terrified, dived back in and woke up. I'm like, yeah, I did it. <laughs> And so the first year or two was like this. I would pop out of body, and I'd go, yeah, and boom, right back in. So it was five seconds for a year. So the excitement was forcing you back, basically. Yep. Until okay. about a year into it, <laughs> full serious. I mean, it took me a long time to get over this excitement. And I popped out of body one day. I'm like, <gasps> okay, calm down. Just calm. <laughs> Remain calm. And I was able to do it and stay out, you know, like a minute, which, believe me, is a long time when you're out of body. Well, hold that thought. So what what I think we're going to do is we're going to um, end this episode. And I, and I want to focus in the next episode on your experiences out of body. So, so far, we've defined what an OBE is. We've gone through how to do it. And we've talked about the initial kind of tepid steps that you personally took in order to get it and, and how long it took. Uh, so uh, everyone just, uh, you know, thank you, Preston, for, for joining us again um, and join us for the next episode where Preston's going to get into more detail about his um, out of, you know, series of out of body experiences, um, which, you know, if you go to his uh, personal YouTube channel, there's actually a, a really good episode uh, where I, I think you've you've done one or two. You may have done two episodes, right? This time, uh, ju just one so far, but it's pretty comprehensive. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. You've actually you actually go through this, and you go into the very like an hour. I think you go through it. So, um, let, I want to focus a little bit more time on your your journeys um, in the next episode. So, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Preston, and see you soon. If you enjoyed this video, hit like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.